This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. We are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know. This week, Disney animator and director, producer, Saul Blinkoff. I've known Saul for quite a few years. I've had him speak to many of my groups at the University of Maryland. He is always an absolute smash hit. People love his story, his energy, his wisdom, and he's just a fabulous person making a great Kiddush Hashem sanctification of God's name as a real insider in Hollywood, in the animation business, in the movie production game. So our listeners are in for a great treat in this episode. Meanwhile, a reminder is always to follow us on social media at Jews You Should Know, spelled out fully on Instagram and Facebook. Jews You Should Know with the letter U on Twitter. Subscribe wherever you're listening, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Please share this podcast with friends and family. Let them know how to subscribe so that you and they can get every new episode directly into your feed. Sponsorships and other questions or comments at Jews You Should Know at gmail.com. And now to our conversation with Disney and DreamWorks animator, producer, director, and wonderful Jewish role model, Saul Blinkoff. We are here with Saul Blinkoff. Saul is a Disney animator and director. He is currently a supervising producer at DreamWorks. And most recently, he is the host of a weekly inspirational podcast called Life of Awesome. Did I get that right, Saul? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is a mouthful, Saul. And, and that is uh, all of those things, I think, are amazing expressions of your tremendous talents and certainly from what I know of your story. But of course, you don't wake up one day as a Disney animator and nor do you just wake up as a born podcaster, as I can certainly tell you. That's right. All of that is an, part of an evolution. And for those uh, in the audience, I have gotten to hear Saul's story quite a few times as he's spoken to audiences college students all over the country. And it's an incredible, incredible story. And I want our listeners to hear it as well. So Saul, take it from the top. Tell us where you're from. Thank you so much for having me, by the way. I know it's been a long time to get this on the calendar, but you know, uh, I really appreciate your patience. So excited to be here. I live in LA now, but I grew up in New York, Long Island. You know, uh, I had a normal childhood. I have a brother who's a year older. I have a twin sister. And when I was six years old, I just, I love to draw. That's really where it started for me. Um, You know, Rabbi, I I started drawing like all kids do. And I knew that someday I was going to be an artist. That was the dream. I wanted to be an artist. And then I'm uh, 11 years old. I go to the movies and I see a movie that changes my life. I saw the movie E.T., which hopefully your audience is. (laughs) Oh, no, there you go. (laughs) So I'm watching that movie. And at the end of the movie, the, the credits are scrolling. I remember tapping my mom and I'm like, mom, that's what I want to do someday. And she's like, what, you, you want to leave planet Earth in a spaceship? <laughs> I'm like, no, mom, I want to make movies. Now you got to remember, I grew up in New York, right? I didn't know any filmmakers. I didn't know any Hollywood people. I didn't even know that was a job you could do. All I knew was when I was 11 years old and looking up to that screen, it was something that made me go, Look, that's what I want to be a part of. I just had one problem is that I had no idea how to do it. So I went to a building, which I'm sure half of your audience has never even heard of or been to. It's called a library. That's right. These, this is before the internet, <laughs> right? So I go to a library and I get books on cameras, lenses, storyboarding. I found out the director of ET is a Jewish guy named Steven Spielberg. I thought, oh, if he could do it, I could do it. And Spielberg, I found out every weekend would make movies with his kids in the neighborhood. So I get my sister, my older brother, and we start making movies, murder movies, monster movies. One movie, I tied my sister up to a tree. <laughs> It was a kidnap movie. Like, don't worry, and, mom. It's just a movie. That's right. And then we go she hasn't in, been home in a week. Let's go. <laughs> that's what happened. We go into the house to watch the movie. I still remember my mom going, I love the movie. But where's your sister? I said, well, she's still tied to the tree. What's wrong? <laughs> it's a win-win. We call that it's a win-win, <laughs> right? I'm sorry to my sister, Rena, if you're listening. You know, we've put our relationship together since then. So I knew I was going to be, a, um, you know, a, a movie maker, a director. And then I get to high school. And when I was in high school, somebody comes up to me in high school, I'll never forget. And they go, well, what are you going to do when you get out of high school? I go, well, I want to be a filmmaker. Like, no, you don't. Because if you want to do that, you're going to have to move out to Hollywood. And Hollywood is filled with crazy weirdos. You you don't want to end up a weirdo, do you? 
And I'm telling you right then and there, I gave up on my dream of wanting to be a filmmaker because one person would tell me I would end up a weirdo. You know, it's amazing how in life we're so impressionable. Someone says something, it could change the trajectory of our entire decision-making plan. And I gave up on everything. Of course, today, I do live in Hollywood, and my four kids would tell you, daddy is a weirdo. So, so much for that. I really resonate with that message because, you know, in this very podcast, I, in, in our hundredth episode, I did like kind of a, a retrospective and kind of explained the origin of the podcast. And I had a similar experience. Or I had this dream of doing this and interviewing all these amazing, you know, Jewish personalities. And I tried reaching out to one guest. It was kind of like a dream get. He turned me down, he turned me down. And I gave it up for like a couple of years. And I, I pushed it off for years because of one rejection. I was like, ah, nobody wants to talk to me. And it wasn't wow. that it was one person, you know, right. just and one person, just one person. Since then I've interviewed, you know, some of them, I've interviewed the Israeli ambassador. I've interviewed Natan Sharansky. I've interviewed some of the most amazing people in the Jewish wow. world. Saul Blinkoff, you wow. know, and you many, many people say yes, you know, right. But right. That one guy said no. And I was like, oh, I guess, I guess it doesn't work. So I really, right. which, which by the way, is also a testament to the fact that we each have the ability and power to affect people. Right. If, if one person could turn someone off and one person can turn someone on to believing in themselves and, and going for their goals. And look, at that point, uh, I had I gave up on that. And instead, my parents said, so what are you going to do? I go, well, I'll just go back to being an artist. So, you know, thank God I have very supportive parents. They got an art teacher to come to my home. And every week she would teach me to draw from life. She'd have me draw hands from different positions or set up a bowl of fruit. I still remember her saying, Saul, drawing is about seeing. See, I was so focused on how much it looks like the thing. She's like, no, no, you have to see. Make sure you develop your eye. It was an amazing teacher. So she comes to the house every week and I'm drawing. Then I go to the movies and I see another movie that changes my life. I saw the movie and I'm curious if you've seen this one, Rabbi. I saw the movie, The Little Mermaid. I don't that? want to, uh, you know, out my, I'll tell you off camera. <laughs> okay, fine. Translation, he's seen it. Okay. Um, so I go see The Little Mermaid and I'm mesmerized by Disney animation. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is a perfect thing. I remember actually tapping my mom like, mom, that's what I want to do someday. She's like, what, you want to fall in love with a fish? <laughs> I'm like, no, mom, I want to work at Disney. And this was like the perfect thing for me because it was taking my two passions, my love of drawing, my love of filmmaking, put them together, animation. And plus, this is the best part. I found out that Disney had a studio in Orlando, Florida. I don't have to go out to LA. So there I am, junior in high school, and I know exactly what I want to do. My dream is to become a Disney animator. I just had one problem. I had no idea how to do it. But like I told you guys before, I had the most supportive parents. So my mom takes me, not my older brother, not my sister, takes me on a trip to Disney World just to walk around Disney World and ask people, how can my son work here someday? Incredible. Right? Today, you want to find out how to be a Disney animator. You go to the website. There was no websites back then. You go to Google. There was no Google. Back then, plane walk around Disney World. And we were walking around. I still remember we were getting on the It's a Small World boat ride. And we're getting on the boat ride. And the Disney cast member says to my mom, uh, how many in your party? And we're getting on the boat. We're like two. And as we're getting on the boat, my mom's like, oh, by the way, my son wants to be a Disney animator. Can you help him? And the lady's like, man, this is a boat ride. You know, we don't hire <laughs> Disney employees here. So we go through the boat ride afterwards. The woman says, look, if you want your son to work for the company, there's a building called the Disney Casting Building. And it's like four minutes from where we were in Disney World. She says, go to this building and have an interview. So we pull up to this building. It was incredible. I had a shirt and tie. I was a high school kid. And I pull up to this building with my mom. And it's, can you imagine what a Disney office building looks like? It was beautiful. It had uh, the doorknobs that look like the ones from Alice in Wonderland that talk, right? Made out of bronze. I open up the doors. I walk into this atrium. Gold statuettes of Mickey, Donald, Pluto, goofy Dumbo. I mean, wow. Even the air in there was like, like Disney air, like pixie dust in the air, you know? So I sit there for the interview and the woman says, look, if you want to work at Disney animation, this isn't where you try out. I'm like, well, who, who applies here? She goes, these are for people that work in the parks, people that you know, make the Dumbo ride go up and down, people that sell merchandising. She goes, I'm like, well, where do I apply for Disney animation? She goes, look, I don't know, but all I can tell you is this. She takes out her desk takes out a piece of paper. That piece of paper was the most valuable piece of paper I ever held in my hands, other than my wedding ketubah, wedding contract, of course, <laughs> in case my wife is listening. You see, that piece of paper she gave me was a list of eight schools, eight art schools that Disney recruits their artists from. She says, if you want to be a Disney animator, you need to go to one of these schools. And right there, I had what I call 
the recipe. You know, you go to a great restaurant, you want to taste an unbelievable dessert. You can make it if you have the recipe. I'm sure you remember when you were building your podcast, when you found out all the things you had to do in order to produce a podcast. It was probably like a new world for you. Totally. But, but if we look at our lives and look at our goals as an equation, me plus what will equal my dream, we need to find out the how. And it sounds so obvious, but so many people I meet who are lucky enough to have a goal, they just don't know how to achieve it. So that was it, the recipe. So my mom takes me on a trip around the United States, just testing out these schools, seeing which would be a good, a good school fit for her son, which would be a good uh, social fit. We're going to schools in Maryland and New York and all over Columbus, Ohio. And we get to one school in Columbus, Ohio, the Columbus College of Art and Design. And we're getting toured around the school by the guy who like brings in new students. And I'm looking at the artwork on the walls and I'm telling you every single piece of artwork on the walls was a hundred times better than anything that I could ever do. And I felt totally intimidated, overwhelmed. I remember saying to the guy, I'm like, your seniors are so talented. He said, Saul, every single piece of artwork that you see on the walls was done by our freshman class. I'm like, what? They're a year and a half older than me and they're a hundred times better than me. I was totally intimidated. I felt like, why would I want to go to a school like this? Right? I would have been the worst. If I chose that school, and I'm telling you, I would have been the worst one at the school. But I have a theory. See, I don't care if you're two years old. I don't care if you're 120 years old. Every single person on the planet wants the exact same thing. Everybody wants a taste of greatness. Everybody wants to live a life of awesome. There's the title of my podcast for you. See, we all want that, but how do you get it? You know, I grew up in the 90s, Michael Jordan, and I'm sure you remember, he was the man. This is before LeBron James, okay? And even now, my son, you know, I have a 12-year-old son, and he gets into arguments with his friends because he defends Michael Jordan because his dad loves Michael Jordan. <laughs> all like, no, LeBron. But Michael Jordan was in the NBA the first year, and after one of his games, he steps off the court, and a sports writer came up to him and said, Michael, you're a scoring machine, but your defense isn't so strong. Michael was like, what? You know, Michael could have said to the guy, I'm going to listen to you. I just made a gajillion dollars playing basketball. Your kid probably has my Air Jordan sneakers on. You probably have posters of me up over your room. I'm going to listen to you. But Michael said years later in an interview, he heard one thing. When that sports writer told me, he said that I didn't have a good defensive game, I thought one thing, I guess I better work harder on defense. And he did. And next year in the NBA, one player was named Defensive Player of the Year. Number 23, Michael Jordan. Because if we want to be great at anything in life, the first thing we need to know is what it is we do well. The next thing we know, where's our flaws? And take those flaws, and here's the answer key, and turn them into our strengths. And I thought to myself, you know what? If Michael could do it, find out what his flaws are and turn them into strengths. And I was intimidated by this school, and I saw my flaws coming out. Then if I go to a school like this, maybe that'll be the environment to turn them into strengths. And I chose the school. Thank God they chose me. You know, right, obviously I go you had this, enough talent to get in, at least. I had enough talent to get in. I mean, talent's an interesting word. You know, I'm not so sure I buy the word talent so much. I'd say I'd, I'd had enough discipline that I'd put into my art to get to a certain level. But still, I was at the bottom of the ladder, you know. Um, so anyway, I get to school that first day. And I remember about to walk into my room. And uh, I walk in, I'm about to walk into the dorm room. And I'm thinking, like, who's my roommate going to be? Like, just God, have me be living with someone a little normal, please. I open up the door. I go in. And my roommate had already settled his things in there, but he wasn't in the room at the time. Everything he had was the color black. All his clothes were black. His pants, his shirts, his shoes, all his clothes black. He looked like he was out of a Tim Burton movie. And over his bed was a life-size sculpture of JC on a cross. Okay, I was the only Jew in my school. While I was painting, you know, bowls of fruit and drawing hands for my art teacher, this guy was making a life-size sculpture of paper mache of JC on the cross. He was a devout Catholic. And I'm like, where am I? You know, then the guy walks in and I meet him. He's got a big blonde mop of hair over one eye. I never saw that eye. He was like the Phantom of the Opera, you know. And uh, he had these red boots that went up to his knees. It was the only color he had, a splash of color but he wouldn't put laces. He had like 50 rungs for the laces, but he wouldn't put laces in the boot. So I'd said to him like, Joe, why don't you put laces in your boot? Why do you walk around flipping the tongue out of the boot? He goes, no, I don't do that. I'm like, why? He goes, because laces means conformity. I don't conform. I'm an artist. I'm like, okay. 
So I remember, uh, I remember walking down the hall a little bit more and I found another guy, uh, looked into his room and I see this guy has Mickey Mouse slippers. And I'm like, what kind of college guy wears Mickey Mouse slippers? He has Mickey Mouse telephone, Mickey Mouse lunchbox, Mickey Mouse bedspread. It was like Disney World in a room. I see in the corner, he has sketchbooks. I'm looking at his sketchbooks. He's got drawings of Mickey Mouse. I never drew Mickey Mouse before. I felt intimidated. I turned to leave the room and I bump into the guy whose room it is. Uh Uh-oh, I'm busted. I go, hey, man, I'm sorry. He looks at me and he goes, how are you doing? (laughs) I'm like, good. What's your name? He goes, my name's Jason, but people call me Mickey Mouse Jason. I'm like, they call you what? He goes, Mickey Mouse. I'm like, I heard you. You have a Disney nickname. He's like, what? You don't? I'm like, no, I don't. I go back to my dorm room. I get on the phone with my mom. True story. She will tell you this herself. I'm like, mom, if I'm going to fit in in this school, I need a Disney nickname. I need Mickey Mouse slippers. I didn't have any Disney anything. All I had was like a couple Disney art books. You have to remember, like I was in a place where everyone wanted to work for Disney. As a matter of fact, a week later, a representative from the Walt Disney Company comes to our school. He stands on a stage. The room, we're in this giant auditorium. First time I saw the whole school in one place, huge, 750 students, every freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And the guy from Disney stands on that stage and he looks out to the audience and he starts by saying this, how many of you want to work at Disney? Every hand went up. He said out of the 750 of you, maybe just maybe four of you will ever work there. That's how competitive it is. And I remember when he said that, I thought one thing, I wonder who the other three are going to be. Because in life, you either believe in yourself that you can accomplish something or you don't. And look, at that time in my life, I believed in myself. I had very supportive parents, supportive friends. I knew I was in a great art school. And I think that's something for your listeners to keep in mind. You know, forget about what you tell people on Facebook, what you show on Instagram, what you tell your friends. Like deep down, do we really believe in ourselves that we can have greatness in whatever it is that we want in our lives? We have to work on that to really believe in ourselves because if we don't buy it, no one else is going to buy it. And when he said that, I'm like, that's it. I'm, I'm going. Then he says, if you want to work at Disney, you got to get the internship. No internship, no Disney. And if you want the internship, he said, you need to have a portfolio of 25 pages of figure drawing and anatomy. You know, a lot of people think that to get into Disney, you got to be able to draw cartoon characters. Truth is, no cartoon characters are allowed in your portfolio. Yeah, he goes, you have to draw people from life and animals from life. He goes, we don't want any cartoon characters. And especially, he said, no drawings of Mickey Mouse. I was like, oh, yeah, Mickey Mouse, Jason. <laughs> Sorry, dude. <laughs> Sorry. You could see him like slouching in his chair. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but like to me, that equation that I talk about was building. First, it was Saul go to one of these schools will equal dream. Now, Disney guy is saying Saul plus figure drawing and anatomy portfolio will equal dream of getting Disney. So I go to figure drawing class. I'm drawing at the zoo all the time. I remember also at that time I met this guy named Andy who soon became my best friend. And I can tell you just hanging out with a guy like this made me a better artist because who we choose to hang out with actually affects who we become. You know, the people that we surround ourselves, their character traits rub off on us. So it's really important to remember to surround ourselves with people that can elevate us. But that's a great thing for single people to hear. If you're dating, find a person that can help you grow. Not a person that's just going to help you stay where you are because in 10 years, you just flat out. You want to grow in life. You got to find someone that can help build you and someone that you can help build. So Andy was that for me and his work ethic became my work ethic. Sophomore year comes. I remember Andy and I are going to send our portfolios in and he's like, you know what? I'm not sending it in yet. I'm not ready. I'm like, you know what? I'm doing it. I get my drawings together. I put them in a portfolio, send them to Disney and I wait. A couple of weeks go by. I get a letter in Disney stationery. It's got a gold leaf Mickey imprinted on there. My name is typed on the front. Wow. I mean, the Disney company knows that I'm alive. They have my name printed on an envelope. And I open up the envelope and it says, Saul, thanks for sending your portfolio in, but unfortunately you didn't make it. So I didn't get it. I was rejected. But you know, I didn't even care because I was just happy to go through that process. I was happy that they knew I was alive. I took that letter, that rejection letter, put it up over my desk. I remember my friends coming in, wow, Saul, Disney company knows that you're alive. That's more than we have, you know? Another year goes by, and Andy and I are getting our portfolios together. And I remember we went to the, uh, the Columbus Zoo. Anyone lives on the East Coast or the mid- Midwest, you know it gets cold in the wintertime. I live in LA. My kids have no idea what this is, cold. 
So we go to the Columbus Zoo to draw elephants. Now, when you guys are watching a Disney movie, how do you think Disney animators know how to draw animals? You don't just wake up and know how to draw any animal. You sit with anatomy books. You go to the zoo. You draw animals from life. Walt Disney used to bring deer into the studio when they were making Bambi. For Lion King, they brought lions into the actual studio. Incredible. So me and Andy are at the zoo, and it was a freezing cold day. And there's 15 students in the bus to go to the zoo. And we go to this cafe in the zoo, and we're just getting hot chocolate and tea because it's freezing. And everyone's hanging out in the cafe. Me and Andy go out and uh, are drawing the elephant freezing. It was freezing out there. Afterwards, we go into the bus, and we're showing our drawings to each other. And all of our friends were like, hey, we're, what's the drawings you did? We show them our drawings. And we said, our friends, where's the drawings you did? And they go, well, we didn't draw any. We're like, what do you mean you didn't draw any? That elephant was walking. But you didn't go to the monkeys. You didn't what? They're like, no, we never left the cafe. I'm like, why? They go, we couldn't. I said, what do you mean you couldn't? They said, we couldn't because it was too cold. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, yeah, it was too cold. We weren't going to go out there. It's freezing. I'm like, but, but you said it was your dream to be a Disney animator. Yeah, it is. Unless it gets too difficult, you mean. Oh, you see, so often may, many people have lofty dreams. But when it comes to getting out of their comfort zone, going through a little bit of struggle, a little bit of pain, I'm out. And it was right then and there I knew that I had the edge to get me into Disney because that's what separated me from Andy. We didn't care how painful it was, how cold it was. While everyone else was partying, we were drawing. So we get our portfolios together and we send them into Disney. And a couple of weeks go by. I'm home in New York and uh, I get a call. I was home in New York. It was, a, it was a vacation break. I get a call and it's Andy. I'm like, hey, man, what's up? He's like, blink off. Did you hear? I'm like, no, did you? He goes, yeah. I go, what'd you hear? He goes, I got it. I said, you got what? He goes, I got the internship. I'm like, that's amazing. Congratulations. He's like, but you didn't hear? I'm like, no, but they could be trying to call me right now. I got to hang out. We didn't have call waiting back then. Okay. So I hang up the phone and I'm like, oh my gosh, pacing in my dining room. I can't stand it. I call up Disney myself. I go, excuse me, my name is Saul Blinkoff. I want to find out about the internship. And I remember the guy going, oh, Saul, I have your name on a list. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, yeah, you didn't make it. I'm like, what? He goes, yeah, you, you didn't make it. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm like, well, what about Andy? He's like, yeah, he made it. You didn't. I'm like, oh, I hang up the phone. And that was a, that was a bittersweet moment. That was a sweet moment because I was very happy for my best friend. But bitter because I wasn't getting my dream. You know where Andy's going? To Disney World. Rabbi, you know what they call Disney World? They call it the happiest place on earth. On earth. What a great tagline <laughs> to call your place, right? That's basically telling everybody, I know you may think you're happy in life. But if you want to be happiest, the only place you can do that is in Disney World. And Andy's going to Disney World in the sun, beautiful Disney World. And I'm going back to Ohio in the wintertime, the most depressing place on earth. No offense to anyone from Ohio who's listening, but you know what I mean? It's cold and those skies are gray for like 11 months of the year. At least it feels that way. And when I get to school, I'm walking the halls and people are coming up to me and they're like, Blink off, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Why didn't you? Oh, you didn't get in. Oh, I'm sorry. Where's Andy? Oh, he got in. You didn't. I became known as the guy that was friends with the guy that got into Disney. I became known as the guy who didn't get what he really, really wanted. And I felt like a loser. And then I came up with probably the greatest tool that I ever discovered. And I hope your listeners are listening. If there's ever something you really, really want in your life and you don't get it, if there's something you want so much and you don't get it, you get rejected and you feel like a loser, do what I do. And that feeling goes away in a second. You know what I did? I gave up. I gave up on the entire dream because reality set in. And reality is Andy was an awesome artist. And I was just me, average artist who worked really, really hard, but I just wasn't at that level. And I gave up on the whole thing. A week later, a buddy calls me up to go see a movie. I'm like, eh, I'm not in the mood. He's like, but I got free tickets. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go. <laughs> you know, when you're in university, someone offers you something free, you take it. So I go. And I'm watching this movie. And at the end of the movie, tears are streaming down my face. Tears are streaming down my face. This movie is a true story about a guy who's five feet tall. He doesn't have an ounce of athletic ability, and he wants to play football at Notre Dame. Rabbi, what movie is it? Rudy. 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 There you go. You've seen that. You'll admit that one. Just that one. Is, that ain't no Little Mermaid. <laughs> That's fine. So I'm watching the movie, Rudy. And for those people listening, if you haven't seen it, see the movie. It's a wonderful, inspiring movie. I give it the kosher seal. You know, you could watch it. Totally appropriate. Yeah, incredible movie. 
about a guy who achieved something impossible. And it's a true story. And if you looked at Rudy Rudiger, he's only five feet something. He's not even an athlete. He wants to play football at Notre Dame. You know what football players look like? That's not him. And if you were friends with Rudy and he told you his dream, you know what you would have said to him? Dude, I love you. Get a new dream. But Rudy goes, oh, yeah? Well, we'll just see about that. And he tries to get in. And you know what happens? Rejected. Tries a second time. Rejected. But third time? Rejected. But fourth time? You know, you look at the movie poster for the movie Rudy. It says, when people tell you dreams don't come true, tell them about Rudy. He gets in and tears are streaming down my face because I'm thinking one thing. If an unathletic guy could get into Notre Dame through an insane amount of hard work, then an untalented artist like me could get into Disney with an insane amount of hard work. And then I called up Disney the next day, get the guy on the phone. I go, excuse me, how close was I to getting in? He said, Saul, what do you mean? I go, well, how many interns did you pick? He said, we picked 17 from over 3,800 portfolios. I said, so how close was I? He goes, well, you made it to number 20. What? I missed it by three. Do you know how many times in our lives we could be so close to achieving something, but we feel we're miles and miles away? Then I asked him another question. How come I didn't get in? You see, there's going to be moments in our lives when we get rejected. What are we going to do? Wake up and blame everybody else that we're rejected? You know, you're going to get fired from your job. Oh, it's my boss's problem. You know, you're going to have someone break up with you in a relationship. Oh, it's their problem. At the end of the day, every time we fail in any way, there's always an opportunity to grow. And I asked him, how come I didn't get in? He goes, so you know what? You draw well, but you need more perspective in your drawing. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, instead of drawing people from wherever your eye level is or animals from your eye level, like stand on something or look up at something. Give us a dynamic perspective. I remember going back to the zoo and the Columbus Zoo, they gave me special permission to go backstage where they fed the giraffes. And I stood on this ladder scaffolding thing and was looking down 30 feet above as they fed the giraffe. How many people get to see a giraffe looking down? That's incredible. I put those drawings in my portfolio. And I put a whole new portfolio together and I sent them into Disney and I waited. And uh, a couple months go by, I get a call from Andy. I'm like, hey, man, what's up? He's like, blink off. You're not going to believe this. I'm like, what am I not going to believe? He goes, they, they built a brand new wing of the studio for animators coming in. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, wow. He's like, yeah, you deserve to be there. I'm like, thanks, man. He goes, but there's one more thing. I'm like, what? He says, they put up a list of the next interns. I'm like, yeah. And he goes, you're on the list. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, dude, you did it. I'm like, what? Oh my gosh. Thank you. He's like, what are you thanking me for? You're the one that did it. I'm like, oh my God. I hang up the phone. I go over and I call my parents. Can you imagine how fast I dialed my parents? Just so they know that their son that they've invested all this money into wasn't a total screw up. I dialed as fast as I could. I dialed my mom and dad could hear it in my voice. They're like, honey, did you do it? I'm like, no, we did it. My mom was like, what do you mean? I'm like, mom, remember you took me to Disney? You took me to this school and that school? I tell this to students all the time. You know, as much as you want something for yourself, your parents want it for you times a billion. But I said to my mom, this winter, you can stay in New York because I'm going to the happiest place on earth. <laughs> so I end up in Disney World and... uh you know, just telling you that story right now, Rabbi, I, I, it takes me back to that moment in my life where you're in shock. It, it was a shock that I accomplished this goal. And I get there and there's a sign that I walked under to get into the door, the entrance. It called art. It said artist entrance. And I walk into this room. There was about 15 to 17 animation desks. This is before computer animation, before Pixar. And in the corner, is a desk, a big wood desk with my name, Saul Blinkoff, Jewish kid from New York. I didn't have any contacts there. I didn't know anyone. I mean, I knew Andy, but it didn't help me get in. It was just an insane amount of hard work. And I hope that your listeners hear that and realize that, you know, nobody wakes up great at anything. We think that greatness is what other people have, not us. Nobody wakes up great at anything. You know, Michael Jordan became great. The guy took 750 jump shots every day before breakfast. Nobody wakes up great in anything. And I can tell you, when I started at Disney, I was at the bottom of the ladder again. I had all that work to do again. And I was working on the internship. We found out on the internship, we were going to work on the movie Pocahontas. This is back in the day. Have you heard of that one, Rabbi? <laughs> so we're working on Pocahontas. And uh, the first drawing I got to do in that movie was a scene where uh, Coquim was the guy she's supposed to marry, is looking at her talking to John Smith at night, a dramatic scene. And he pushes these leaves away. And they asked me to animate the leaves. I was the leaf guy at Disney. 
And you know what? I was okay with that because you do a drawing of a leaf on your page. It's this, it's this big. It's, you know, two inches. But on a movie screen, it's a 50-foot leaf. It better be a good leaf. And I remember taking a Xerox of that leaf drawing, sent it home to my mom. You know, Xerox, right? She tells everybody in the community, oh, my son draws leaves for Disney. She's so proud, you know, nice Jewish mother. And after that internship, I got to work on Pocahontas herself, a couple of those scenes. And then they uh, offered me a five-year contract. So my life was beginning, uh, living the dream. In Disney World, I started working on the Hunchback of Notre Dame. As a matter of fact, during Hunchback, I got a call from my mom and dad. And they're like, hey, honey, do you have any vacation time? I'm like, yeah. They're like, why don't you come to Israel with us? So I go to Israel with my parents for a week vacation. Great time. And, you know, I didn't grow up religious or observant, but I didn't grow up totally secular either. You know, I grew up, you know, conservative, conservadox, traditional, whatever word you like. You know, Shabbat was meaningful. My dad lit, uh, my mom lit Shabbos candles. My dad said Kiddush. But Judaism for me was really, uh, really about my parents. Uh, and it was like our family time together. But as a, as a man, as an adult, I never really thought about how I fit into the Jewish people. And I remember being in Israel and thinking about that and thinking, you know, what's, what's my identity as a Jew? And I remember feeling, I wish I knew more about Judaism as an adult. I go back to Disney, start working the movie Mulan. That's uh, the uh, Chinese movie, you know, let's get down to business to defeat uh, uh, the Huns. Huh, Rabbi, you know it. That's it, baby. Right. And uh, I was working on Mulan, which was an incredible experience. Just great. I'm 20 something years old and living the dream at Disney World. It was amazing. After Mulan, we find out we're going to work on the movie Tarzan, but they weren't ready for us to go on to Tarzan yet because they were having trouble with the script. So they told the animators, you know what? Don't come in. We'll tell you when the script's ready. They called it downtime. And downtime, which started as one week, turned into two weeks, turned into six months. And you know what downtime is? They said, you don't have to come in. We're going to pay you. You know what downtime is in Disney World? You ride roller coasters all day. Disney has over 15 hotels. Me and my friends would go to a different swimming pool every day. And I remember I was floating on my back in one of these hotels on the pool, one of those lazy rivers. You don't have to be alive and you can swim. I, love <laughs> I got a cold drink in my hand and uh, I had everything I could have wanted. I had my dream job. Imagine if you could make a list of everything you want. I had my dream job. I had this incredible girlfriend who I later married. I had great friends making great money. I could buy almost anything I wanted as a 20, whatever year old, everything was going for me. And one day floating on my back in that pool, I remember getting this feeling like something's missing. And I realized right then and there, you know what's missing? I don't understand my Jewish identity. I don't know what Judaism means to me. And I got out of the pool and uh, I told all my friends, none of them were Jewish. I said, you know, I'm going to Israel. I want to go learn in Israel a little bit. And they're like, well, why? You know, and I go, because I want to find out how I fit in to the Jewish people. And one of my friends is like, what do you mean fit in? What are you, a puzzle piece? <laughs> you know? And I said, look, I don't know my Jewish identity. So I go on a program. I found out. I researched a program. Found a program. I was on there for 10 days. That's it. The program was called Israelite with Rabbi David Aaron and Rabbi Benny Freeman. I'm sure you know them. And uh, I go on this program. There's all young professionals there. There's me and two other guys and seven women. And we're all there just to learn about Judaism. And the first day, the rabbi, Rabbi Benny Friedman, walks in. He speaks to us for 15 minutes. And what he said in those 15 minutes changed the course of the rest of my life. And here's what he said. He looked out to us and he goes, how many of you know what a mezuzah is? I'm like, a mezuzah, the thing on the doorway. Yeah, I know what it is. He goes, what's inside? I'm like, I don't know, isn't there like a paper in there? So I, don't, I didn't really know. He goes, well, what's it for? I'm like, doesn't it like guard your house from evil spirits? I don't know. He's like, inside the mezuzah is a piece of paper. It's a parchment. And written on that parchment is a line from the Torah. It's the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. It comes right from the Torah. It basically says God runs the world. And he said to us, you know what Torah is? Many people think Torah is a history book. Torah, he said, was a love letter from God to humanity. And when you get something that means something, a letter, a family heirloom, you put it in a special place. He says, you know what we're commanded to do? Take the mezuzah and where are we commanded to put it? On our doorway. How does that make sense? 
Imagine you get a letter from the creator of the world. You get a letter from God. Where are you going to put it? You're going to put it under a locking key. You're going to put it, frame it with the most beautiful frame in the center of your home. You're not going to be like, oh, honey, I got the perfect place for this doorway. And this is what the rabbi said. He said, you know what a doorway is? A doorway is a transition. We're going from our home out into the world. A doorway is a transition. A mezuzah, he said, is not a thing. It's an opportunity. Before I go out into the world, it's an opportunity to remind myself, I'm going out into the world. What kind of a world do I want to create? What am I living for? It's an opportunity for me to clarify my purpose of even leaving my home. What am I going to do today? What's my objective? Do I want to take from the world? Do I want to give to the world? Do I want the world to stay as it is? Or do I want to change the world? You know, you're coming into your home. There's a mezuzah there. It's an opportunity for me to ask a question. You know, I'm going to my home. What kind of a home do I want? What are the values I want to have in my home? Why do I need a partner to help me create a home? You know, I have a tough day at work. I work at DreamWorks. And before COVID, I'd be driving to work. I come home. Let's say I had a tough day. I'm going to walk in my home and be like, oh, honey, let me tell you about my tough day. Let me tell everybody about my tough. Wait a minute. Do I even know what kind of day my wife had? What about my kids? What, a seven-year-old can't have a tough day? Sure they can. Mezuzah is an opportunity for me to go, you know what? Dad, keep your stuff at the door. Why don't you go in and just say, hey, honey, how was your day? Hey, kids, how are you doing? Opportunities. And I never knew any of this before. I thought it was amazing. And then he told us a story of a woman in the Holocaust, 21, 22 years old, true story. And a, a woman looks to one of the rabbis, she was in Auschwitz, and she says to the rabbi, rabbi, I need a knife. And the rabbi looks into her eyes and he can tell she wants to end her life. And he says, don't do this. Don't let them win. And as they're speaking, two Nazis approach. And one of the Nazis says, what are you doing? And you talk out of turn, they'll shoot you. I mean, they'll shoot you anyway, they're murderers. And she looks up to the Nazi and she sees in his breast pocket is the outline of a knife. And she looks at him and demands his knife. She says, give me your knife. And he can't believe she's speaking to him this way. The other one says, you know what? Give her the knife. What's she going to do? We have guns. So they hand her the knife. And she reaches down to her leg and pulls up a bundle of clothing. And inside that bundle is a brand new baby boy. It's her son. And she holds that baby in her hands that she was hiding. And she looks up to the heavens and she takes that sharp knife and she says, God, you gave me this beautiful baby boy. And now I'm going to return him to you perfect. And with that, she took the knife and performed on her own son, a bris mila, a circumcision. You know why? Because the kid's a Jew. And she takes her son, who's now crying from the bris mila, and puts him into the arms of the Nazi and walks away. Ksh, baby was killed. Ksh, she was shot also. True story. And you hear that story. Can you imagine the tears over Auschwitz? But there's something so deep in that story. You know, Reb Noah Weinberg used to say, if we don't know what we're willing to die for, we're not living for anything. So pick something that we're living to die for and now live for it. You're a parent listening to this. What, you wouldn't die for your children? Of course you would. But do you live for them? Well, of course I do. Really? Do you spend enough time with them? Are we so busy with our careers? Do we give our kids the time that they actually need? or the time that we want to give them? Do we live for our kids? Do we live for our Jewish identity? What do we live for? And I was just blown away by the story. And I remember the rabbi looked to me and to our, our whole group, and he said, each one of us stands on the shoulders of the most incredible history that any people has ever known. And if you could go back and whisper into the ear of that woman, right when she was handing her son, into the arms of a monster. If you could whisper into her ear, don't worry, because someday the Nazis are going to be gone. And the Jewish people are going to be here and the state of Israel is going to exist. And we're going to be able to have the opportunity to live as Jews, to light Shabbat candles, to put on tefillin, to sit in a sukkah, an amazing thing. And she would have looked at us and not even believed it. She wouldn't even believed it. And the rabbi looks to us and he goes, now that you know that, what will you do with it? So I didn't know what I was going to do with it. All I knew was one thing. For that moment, I no longer wanted to just be Jewish. I wanted to live Jewish. You see, to identify what something is, you're identifying what it does. Okay, so I was Jewish. But how did that inform my life and how I lived? Well, I wanted to figure out the answer to that. So I go back to Disney. 
And uh, I start uh, Friday nights. I opened up uh, a chumash. I got a chumash. And I started reading the Torah portion a little bit each week. And slowly became more observant. Just very, very slowly. I wanted to keep learning and growing. I mean, there were days where I thought there's no way I would ever wear a kippah out in public. You know, if it wasn't if I wasn't going to synagogue, there's no way. There's no way I would only eat kosher food. But everything was a very, very slow process where I found ways to incorporate my Jewish identity into my life. And I'll tell you, uh, when I returned to Disney over the next couple of years, I worked really hard and became a director. I started directing a Winnie the Pooh movie. And one of the first things I had to do as a director on that movie is I had a drawing of the hundred acre wood where Winnie the Pooh lives. And he has a, a tree that he lives in with a little door. And one of the first things I did is I had to approve that drawing before it would go to the department to get painted. So when everyone was not in the room, you know, you've heard that Disney people hide things in the movies. Have you ever heard about that, Rabbi? I've heard that, yeah. They hide hidden things, right? So I went and sharpened it. You've heard that? So I sharpened the pencil. I go over Winnie the Pooh's door and I drew next to his doorway a mezuzah. I hid it in the movie. Now he's not Winnie the Pooh. He's Winnie the Jew. <laughs> and uh, the second movie I directed was Kronk's New Groove, the sequel to Emperor's New Groove. I remember reading the script. It says, Kronk gets married. I'm like, this is great. We'll give him a chuppah, the wedding canopy. So I got my wedding album that had the calla lily flowers that my wife and I had at our wedding. I gave that to the artist for inspiration and reference. And when you watch the movie, you'll see Kronk. He's under the chuppah. He steps on the glass. Mazel tov. It's in the movie. And basically, I didn't just see myself as a filmmaker anymore. I saw myself as a Jewish filmmaker. I started seeing the word Jewish as an adjective to describe myself in every scenario in life, not just, you know, during Shabbat or during Yom Kippur, but every day, every moment. And the more that I realized that Judaism had answers for me to grow, the more I wanted it. You know, the word Torah actually is a Hebrew word, as I'm sure you know, Rabbi, means directions or instructions. And one of the things I remember learning is that Torah is known as Torah Chaim, or if you're at Ashkenaz, Torah Chaim. And it basically means tools for living. And if we want to be great at anything in life, how would we not use the answer key? Like, you know, the, the instruction manual, Steve Jobs and creates an iPhone is like, if you want the optimal use from this iPhone, use the instruction manual. You would be an idiot to go, you know, I'll figure this out on my own. The creator of the world is like, I'm giving you the greatest gift the instruction manual for living. You want to have a great marriage? What does Torah tell you about marriage? You want to control your anger? What does Torah tell you about controlling your anger? And I remember just accessing Torah ideas more and finding places. Look, it's incredible that you're doing this podcast. This is the kind of thing that there's no shortage of great education and information and wisdom out there. And people should harness it and get as much as they can. And I'll tell you, you know, I live in LA today and people say to me, you know, how do you live in LA and balance living an observant life? And I say, how do you not, you know, I'm a busy guy. I have texts going as I'm sure you do, Rabbi, every second of the day, whether it's an in Instagram, which by the way, I hope all of your listeners are going to follow me on Instagram because I'm posting lots of fun, inspirational quotes all the time and pictures of my beautiful family. Thank you. <laughs> uh, by the way, everyone listening, if you ever come out to LA, look me up, come out here, come have Shabbat dinner with us after COVID. And I mean it, maybe not all the same night, you know, that's a lot of hollas, you know, for my wife. <laughs> we'll space it out. <laughs> that's right. But we love hosting people. And if you ever really do come out to LA, and I mean this, I really do. Uh, my wife and I would love to host you. Just, you know, reach out to me and say, hey, I heard you on uh, Koretsky's podcast. Can, uh, come to us. You say Koretsky, you can get in that's for it. free. Gold okay? ticket. You know? <laughs> Gold ticket. But um, look, I, like I said, I'm a very busy guy. You know, all of us are busy. And when I'm sitting at the table Tuesday night, if I get a text or an email or a work call, I got to get out of the, I, get, I literally get up from the table and I go do a work call because it's, it's the most important thing at that moment. But Friday night comes, I shut off my iPhone. I shut off the iPad, computer's off. My kids don't just think daddy's home. They know that daddy is home and I get to have that time with them. And uh, it's an incredible thing. I'll tell you one quick story. We have a son, Asher. He's, uh, he's going to be 13, please God, soon. His bar mitzvah is coming up in uh, less than a year, which is incredible. And uh, when he was about six, we noticed he had this really sweet voice. And we thought, uh, you know, he might be great for a voiceover. You know, when you guys are watching an animated movie, there's people that do the voices for those characters. We thought, you know, maybe he would be good. So um, we, uh, we find out there's an audition at Sony. Now, I don't work at Sony. I was just a dad that showed up with his son for an audition. I go to there for the audition. There's hundreds of kids in the waiting room. 
And uh, he goes in there, reads the lines. Now, he couldn't read at that point, so they have to give you the lines. It's called line reads. They do the line, he does the line. So they'll be like, but dad, when can we go? And he'll go, but dad, when can we go? It's like musical notes. He hits them perfectly. And eventually he got cast in this movie. He was the voice of a main character in the movie Hotel Transylvania 2. He's the voice for Dennis, the little redhead kid. And it was really cool because when you went to the studio, you saw on this giant wall all the stars that were in the movie. It had like Adam Sandler and Andy Samberg, Selena Gomez, Asher Blinkoff, <laughs> you know. And uh, one story really quick is uh, I went to pick him up. It was uh, Friday afternoon. I picked him up from school and I'm bringing him home. My wife and I are going to host the Shabbat dinner. And uh, I remember my, uh, my wife calling and saying, listen, Sony needs you to bring him over there. They have to record like two lines real quick. I'm like, but honey, we gotta, I got to get home for Shabbat. She's like, you'll make it fine. Just hurry. So he falls asleep in our minivan, you know, and uh, I pull into Sony Studios, and which is not that far from our home. It's about 10 minutes from our home. But when I pull into this on the studio lot, this is a big movie studio with big sound stages, huge. It's like many blocks. It's huge. And I know they're going to have me park right on the right where that parking structure is. I'm going to have to walk him, wake him up, walk him all the way to the other side of the studio lot. It's going to take me 50 minutes to walk him there, just to record two lines and come back crazy. So I get this idea, you know what? Let me just drive all the way there, like through the, through the studio. So I said to the guy at the guard game, look, I got the main character for this movie. He's like, who do you have? I'm like, I have Usher. He's like, no problem. <laughs> like, really? thank you. Yeah, I'm like, oh, it's amazing. I was honest. This is great. You know, honesty wins. I'm pulling in. And as I'm pulling in, I hear him say to the other guard, you know who he's got in there? Who does he have? Usher. He thought I had the r and <laughs> star Usher. I did not correct him. I drove onto the studio a lot. Uh, we did the audition, got home for Shabbos. But uh, I just want to share one final uh, idea. And uh, that is, look, you know, I, I, I got to share some of my story with your listeners and I hope, you know, you hear that I put an insane amount of discipline and hard work into getting my dream at Disney. But I will tell you that that amount of work that I put into that is nothing, nothing compared to the amount of effort and work I put into trying to grow as a person. You know, at the end of the day, my kids aren't going to remember me because they're like, wow, my dad got his name in some Disney movies. Like, who cares, really? I don't mean who cares like it's not valuable. Of course, there's a value there in using our abilities and our passions in order to take responsibility and put the kind of values we want in, into entertainment, if that's your choice. But at the end of the day, I want them to remember me as, you know, hey, my dad tried to work on himself. My dad tried to change the world, take responsibility for the world. My dad tried to live a life of integrity. You know, it's one thing uh, to accomplish, but it's another thing to try to work on ourselves as we're trying to accomplish. That's really most important. You know, Steve Jobs changed the world. He created the iPhone and many other things. But what kind of dad was he? Look, I don't know what kind of dad he was. Now, I'm not going to make a judgment on Steve Jobs. All I will say is that I think at the end of the day, who we become is almost more valuable than, than the things that we're accomplishing along the way. And I urge each of you who are listening if you hear anything in this talk that inspires you or any talk or any book you read, you know, it's one thing to be inspired, but inspiration comes and goes. It slips through our fingertips. You can be inspired one minute and you shut off a podcast and then it's like, okay, now back to my life. But if we don't find a way to turn the wisdom that we've listened to or something that we've learned into action and changing how we live, then all we did was waste our time. There's a rabbi named Rabbi Yitzhak Berkowitz. He's the Rosh Hashiva of Asha Torah. He said something so powerful I never forgot years ago. He said, most people will listen to a class or read a book because they want to hear wisdom that will validate the way they already live their lives. He said, you know what it has to be? Every time we're about to learn anything or listen to anything, the first thing before I hear a word is, I need to be open to hearing something that changes how I live my life. I wish each and every one of you listening the opportunity to turn any inspiration or wisdom that you hear in any aspect of life into action and hopefully wake up every day and realize, as Rabbi David Aaron says, we're not human beings, we're human becomings. We should grow and evolve. And if you want a taste of greatness, realize that you have the instruction manual for living. It's Torah's Chaim Torah, and that we're part of the most incredible people that the world has ever seen, the Jewish people. 
Thank you. So, and just in, in closing, can you just tell us quickly about what's this podcast that you started? Why did you start it? And, and what, where can people find it? Oh, you're the best. Thanks, Rabbi. I get to plug my podcast. You're the best. Well, yeah, you know, um, as you said, I've gotten to speak around the world for many communities and universities. And for the last, I don't know, four or five years, people go, hey, when's the podcast coming? I'm like, yeah, I'll work on it one day. And then uh, about three years ago, I was a guest on a podcast of a friend of mine. Her podcast is called Don't Keep Your Day Job. It's supposed to inspire a person to go for their career goals. And I shared my story there. And every like couple months, I would get an email from her like, people are loving your story. And uh, it got like 20,000 downloads, then 40,000 downloads, then 50,000 downloads. And even to this day, like she's had Matthew McConaughey and she's had Malcolm Gladwell. And she says, Saul, yours is still one of the top, if not the top episode. And she's like, what are you doing? Do a podcast. And my wife's like, do a podcast. You have too much to share. And it had to be the right timing, you know, and it was. And a couple months back, I put everything into it. And it's called Life of Awesome. And I share ideas and tools. They're 15 minute episodes. They're short. And I share just one idea or one tool, whether it's about relationships or marriage or career or any of these aspects. And uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I put movie quotes in them so you can hear movie lines in every episode. I have some really exciting guests. As a matter of fact, one of the first guests I got on my podcast was Rudy Rudiger. No the way. real Rudy. How cool is that? Yeah. Not Jewish, is he? Not Jewish. <laughs> but just to be able to interview him, I mean, I, and I told him over and over again, I'm like, my dreams were realized because of your story. So that's a great episode to go hear. And actually last week, I just interviewed Jim Cummings. He's the guy that does the voice for Winnie the Pooh and Tigger and all these Disney characters. So it's really a fun podcast. It's, it's hopefully motivating. And uh, so go check it out. You can check out my website. It's SaulBlinkoff.com. That has the podcast and speaking and all things about my career. And I'm also on Instagram. And so uh, there you go. Social media time. We'll link all that in the show notes. Yeah. And uh, really appreciate it. Saul Blinkoff, Disney animator, director, producer, and most importantly, a becoming Jew. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Rabbi. And I wish you a day that's not just good, that's not just great, but a day that's awesome. There we go. I love it. Thank you, Rabbi. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews you should know.